And a TGIF, everyone. Welcome into the First Call Podcast. Alongside Jeff Siegel, I'm Jeremy Plunk from First Bet and Express Bet. It was quiet last week, Mr. Siegel, on the Triple Crown Trail. We had some good stakes around the country, but no three-year-olds to speak of. Now we've got a couple of them, and they'll be part of our focus on Louisiana Derby Day at Fairgrounds and also the big Jeff Ruby card at Turfway Park. So we've got a lot to talk about this week. Yeah, I hope we learned something. I've been kind of I, I, looking at your uh, your rankings on, on the countdown, and it, 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 there's not a lot of movement, or at least there hasn't been the last <laughs> no. few weeks, but let's kind of spice it up a little bit. We've got some uh, good uh, three-year-old racing, uh, obviously, this week, and then we'll continue on all the way up to the first Saturday in May and then past that as well. Uh, but some good gambling racing today, good opportunities, I think. we got mm-hmm. some, I know that I got a, uh, what I think is a, a good price play in the Bourbon and Oaks. We'll talk about that at first. All Thursday. right. So uh, let's uh, let's get started. You know, we don't have Sierra Leone back for the Louisiana Derby. He won the Risen Star. He's going to await the Bluegrass Stakes. We don't have Encino back. He won the Bataglia Memorial at Turfway. That was only three weeks ago, though. So he's not running back here uh, in the uh, uh, Jeff Ruby as well. So we're going to get some new faces to the winner's circle, perhaps, uh, on those two big circuits. As 100 Kentucky Derby qualifying points are on the line towards the winners, 50 for the runner-up. So these two races this weekend could produce as many as four Kentucky Derby starters just by the points alone uh, off the top, how it shakes out. Let's look at our schedule of events for our handicapping podcast each week here on First Call. We look at eight races. For those of you watching on YouTube and on Twitter, hit that like button, share with us. Also make some comments during the course of the show. We'd love to hear back from you. Those of you on our traditional audio podcast channels, here are the eight races that Jeff and I will handicap. We're going to do things a little different. We usually go track by track in our race order, but because of the new Bayou Bluegrass Pick 5 wager coming up, on Saturday from Fairgrounds and Turfway. We're going to put the races in the order of the Bayou Bluegrass Pick 5. That's a $1 wager with just a 15% takeout. So good opportunity for horse players to jump into that. We will start off at Fairgrounds with the New Orleans Classic that goes as race number nine on the card uh, in New Orleans. At Turfway, we'll go to the Bourbonnet Oaks next. Back to Fairgrounds for the Fairgrounds Oaks. To Turfway for the big one, the three-year-olds in the Jeff Ruby. And then the sophomore stars shine at Fairgrounds. Final leg of the Bayou Bluegrass Pick 5 will be the Louisiana Derby. We'll get you eight stakes. We always do. So beyond the Bluegrass Pick 5, the Bayou Bluegrass Pick 5, we've got stakes races from Laurel, Oaklawn, and Santa Anita to talk about. At Laurel, the three-year-olds are also auditioning there in the private term stakes got a very interesting one we're going to show you on video stick around for that at oaklawn the essex handicap a prep towards the oaklawn handicap for the older horses big person that one and santa Anita has got the san louis ray for long distance runners on the grass tournament players you've got a couple big shots this weekend to take a look at you've got the 500 dollars santa anita challenge on saturday but if you want to play in some feeder tournaments for a lower entry fee 40 dollars feeders available friday saturday and sunday at Gulfstream. also 40 dollars feeders on friday and sunday at santa anita that will bookend that 500 dollars santa anita challenge and for the promos, the $25,000 Exactathon rolls on for the third straight week. We're giving away money. It's fairgrounds this week. The Exactathon challenges you to pick uh, winning Exacta in six races on the card. So there are 12 races on Saturday at fairgrounds. Hit an Exacta in six of the 12 races. You'll get your share of $20,000 in cash. If you pick the most Exacta races correctly amongst the players, you'll get your share of an additional $5,000. How good were those bonuses last week for Tampa Bay Downs Exacta Thumb? The winners got $238 extra in their account if you hit six Exactas. What a bonus that paid out. And the, and the players who had the most shared that $5,000 amongst themselves. They shared $357 a piece in their accounts uh, for picking the most exact. Those are players on the First Bet and Express Bet platforms who play the Exactathon promo this weekend. Be sure to do it for Fairgrounds. Look, you're going to be betting Fairgrounds anyway, right, Jeff? I mean, you might as well get involved. You might as well hit that uh, uh, entry button and and get involved into the uh, contest and the promotion. Make sure you register for that because if you're playing exact this, it's it's free money being added back into your account. Not only that, but I actually went and checked the weather before the uh, uh, before the uh, the show here, and it looks like it's going to be sunny and dry. If you can yeah. do that, so uh, but today at fairgrounds, but tomorrow's going to be yeah, uh, nice exactly. conditions, and that track will dry out. And just so long as it's not a sea of mud, which it seems like every time we handicap fairgrounds, that's what we get. But I think we're going to be in mm-hmm. good shape here. Uh, on the other hand, many of the races that 
are critical to the handicapping process uh, were contested in the mud. So now we got to nice. see if that that form will hold or not. But uh, uh, other than that, uh, good good racing down there this weekend, and uh, we've got uh, a number of the races to we'll look at closely. And I, I, I I'm looking forward to it. Really, yeah. Within the first family, once again, we have the Coast to Coast Pick 5 coming up on Saturday and Sunday. Those are races from Gulfstream and Santa Anita. Here's a look at the races that will comprise Saturday, March 23rd, Coast to Coast Pick 5 at uh, Santa Anita. We start things out in races 3, 5, and 8. Races 3, 5, and 8 just after 5 o'clock East Coast time, 2 o'clock on the West Coast. Races 3, 5, and 8 from Santa Anita will be part of the Coast to Coast Pick 5. The Gulfstream offerings will be races 9 and 11. So 3, 5, and 8 from Santa Anita. 9 and 11 from Gulfstream. Those are your Coast to Coast Pick 5 races coming up for Saturday. But as Jeff and I mentioned, we're going to talk about a new wager this week, the Bayou Bluegrass Pick 5. And that's where we'll start our handicapping from the fairgrounds on Saturday. It'll be race number 9 on the card at fairgrounds, the New Orleans Classic, our first handicapping test in the first leg of this Coast to Coast uh, or the first leg of this Bayou Bluegrass Pick 5. I will mess that up at least once more on the course of the program, separating the different wager names. Jeff, when I handicapped this race the New Orleans Classic, I was handicapping it, trying to figure out the exact thon how I want to play exactas in this particular race. Touch upon a star, the three Three has just been an unbelievable Louisiana bred. Best actors got tremendous speed for Brad Cox. To me, it came down to those two horses. I don't know if they run one, two, because they have the same kind of running style and often horses at lock up like that one of them's going to give way at some point from an exact standpoint maybe you don't want to use both of those horses but on the wind end and you're looking at something like this uh you know bayou bluegrass pick five to me it has to run through those two speed horses one of them wins right yeah i think so and it's funny you bring that up because originally when i handicapped the race i looked at uh, touch upon a star and said okay um he's got uh, several triple digit buyer numbers even though most of them are coming against louisiana bread company uh, he's a front runner. He's got proven form at fairgrounds, four starts, three wins in a second. He's won 11 out of 14. I mean, uh, he's got everything you'd want, um, but at a mile and an eighth, which he's won at, but not against this level of competition, I wonder mm -hmm. if, if he makes the lead and then what does best actor do? And in watching best actor, he came off a long laugh. I got beaten in the mind chat, but I thought that was a really good race he ran. Yeah. A little bit off the bench there. He made the lead. He was hooked by two two pretty decent horses, shrugged them off, opened up, got nailed late uh, by mm -hmm. money supply, but didn't really give up. I think he kind of got a little surprised there at the end. Um, I thought he ran great. And he's going to be put in the position of sitting second. I'm pretty sure Pratt, because the speed's drawn inside, is going to mm -hmm. allow upon a star to go. Best actor is going to stalk him and make the best horse win. I think it's going to be a parade. But I do think best actor is gonna gonna get the best of him at the end. And, and, and trying to watch the visuals and the videos, I think best actor can stalk. It doesn't look necessarily like he wants to do that. Ten starts, first or second, eight out of ten, best on the lead. But I think he's the kind of horse who'll switch off and stalk and pounce if you let him. And I think that's what's gonna happen. So uh, maybe I'm splitting hairs, but you're right about one thing. If you're playing a a rolling type of exotic, uh, uh, I, I I think you have to use them both somewhere. But mm -hmm. my main Bush goes at seven to two in the morning line to best actor who came off a race on an off track that I'm not sure he really loved, but he, he, he ran on it. But I think on fast ground, I think you're going to see best actor uh, really step up and, and run maybe a career top in this race. Is race wide and happy American on the extreme outside looks to unwind. Red route one and finally Hay Strike gets best actor who leads past the quarter pole here for Fabian Pratt after three quarters in one minute eleven point fifty six seconds. Best actor into this final fairgrounds for long as on the outside here's Money Supply who's charging hard for Tyler Gaffleone. Then gasoline and Red Route One they come past the sixteenth. It's Money Supply who's taking a short lead from Best Actor. Money Supply. Money Supply. My money supply flows to like you mentioned, he wasn't giving way there, and if he would have been a little bit closer, maybe they lock up, but just a head decision there, but he wasn't backing up, best actor. Fourth in that race was Red Route 1 in the slop at a mile and a 16th. I think on fast ground at a mile and an eighth, which statistically the record shows that's his best distance. I think Red Route 1 is the closer you want to look in there to maybe get second in the exacta. And for the exactathon blog that I wrote looking at this particular race, I used the two logical speed horses and put Red Route 1 second underneath both of them uh, trying to catch the 
exactly that way. One of the speeds holds on and wins, but Red Route 1 is a horse who would think maybe not a threat on the win end. He doesn't win very often of late, but he's a horse I think who might potentially run second in there. But if you're playing the, the exactus, he's a horse you want to consider. I wouldn't use him, though. I'm not looking for a complete meltdown when we look at the uh, pick five here. I would try to just get by with one or two of the speed horses. Jeff gives the lean uh, to best actor in there. And, of course, touch upon a star when I mention his owners is Set Hut Racing, LLC. Set Hut sounds like a quarterback. It is Jake Delhomme, former uh, Carolina Panthers quarterback, the owner there, and in the family also the trainer. So the Delhomme family well represented uh, with that one. Touch upon a star. What a star guitar like Louisiana Brad, if yeah. you remember him uh, from back a few years ago with that kind of record. Let's go next on our handicapping journey to uh, the second leg of this Bayou Bluegrass pick five. It's Turfway Park's Bourbon Ed Oaks. This is the three-year-old Phillies in route potentially to the Kentucky Oaks here. The sister race on the undercard for the Jeff Ruby. The Bourbon Ed Oaks will be at a mile and a 16th on the main track there at Turfway Park. Of course, only one track. It's the Tapita. And Jeff Siegel in this race for three-year-old Phillies at a mile and a 16th. How do you see it shaking it out? When I first recapped this race, I, I said, okay, I'm going to pick pink polka dots. I, I liked her when she got entered in the grass race uh, March 9th and I, I think that when you when you look at her form, you say, okay, that's fine. Um, now she's going to run on the dirt, and she's a she's one of these. You, she's not waiting around for anybody. She's going to, mm -hmm. and because of that, um, I, I thought she'd have a chance. But she's a little question mark on on dirt, and um, so I, I thought you know six to one. I'm definitely going to use her. But then you got winnable. I, I went to check her debut race. I'm not really thinking that I was going to pick her. Um, there was a discrepancy, not a discrepancy, but a gap between her buyer number of 65 and the 81 that Pink Polka Dots had earned in, in her last win. Um, so I thought that might be a little bit too much to overcome. But then I went and watched the video of Winnabelle, a daughter of Justified, who won her debut at Turf White, which is good because we know she likes this track. And I thought she looked fantastic. And I'm going to bite the bullet against the buyer number and say, not only do I think maybe she's better than the 65 that she earned, but I think she's the kind of filly that's really way, way better than that one race would show. And I think mm -hmm. she's up forward to me uh, in, a, in a massive way for Kenny McPeak. I like Winnable here. She's 10 to 1 in the winning line. I like the two hole. I like mm -hmm. the fact that she won her race stalking, thicket, sitting in the second flight, which is the kind of trip she's going to get. This could be a star in, in the making here for Winnable. And as a gamble at 10 to 1, that's where I'm going with. I, I will have tickets backing up with pink polka dots because I don't know how good she is. Two for two, mm -hmm. runaway wins. But man, winnable to me is a is is a good thing. She's by Justify out of a curling mare. We didn't need to go any farther than that for no, I mean, land on her. But you liked what you saw on video, and I think that's an important factor, not only with this filly, but one we're going to talk about a little bit later on the program. Let's give the fans a chance to see that race. It made a little history for trainer Kenny McPeak off the turn with the lead pink moon fights on back in third is stakeout moonlight gamblers trying to take off here comes moonlight gambler winnable's the leader past the eighth pole moonlight gamblers closing winnable has the lead moonlight gambler is second it's winnable with the lead 2000 career trading victories for kenny mcpeak winnable Gets it done stylishly from moonlight gambler guinevere spell check and my sexy blonde so winnable, potential too deep in the pick fiver here with pink polka dots. Jeff, would you use them both? I would. Uh, the main yeah. principle at the price would be winnable, um, but I'm not going to let pink polka dots get loose in the lead and not have a ticket on her. Because uh, right. you know, here's the thing about her. I mean, again, both of her wins were on grass. Now she's on all weather. It's not, it's not grass, but it's not dirt either. So who's to say she won't like it? And if she mm -hmm. can get loose in the lead, maybe she just outruns everybody. I can see that scenario. But I can also see Win Winnable sit second, maybe even a distant second, and then have a dead aim from the quarter pole home. And, and she she was just under wraps there in the final for a long I don't know how good Winnable is, but I suspect she is. And I wish I had known that before the race when she was 14 to 1. Yes. <laughs> so maybe they wouldn't, hadn't really cranked her up, but uh, that's a good feeling. 
And when a trainer does something a little out of character, that's usually a sign that the horse is doing it. And that's a good sign because Kenny McPeak, not one to have first time starters, just completely cranked up like that. So uh, she won for a barn that's not asking them for everything in their right. career debut. And she ran that well. Third race of the pick five that we're looking at on Saturday for the Bayou Bluegrass Series. We'll go to the fairgrounds for the Fairgrounds Oaks. Race number 11 on the card. Grade two here worth a purse of $400,000 and some name fillies in here. Once upon a time, folks, thought Vivi's dream might be the star of this three-year-old Philly division. She hasn't really panned out so far as a sophomore, but Tarifa and Intricate are back off of a really good performance in the Rachel Alexander where they ran one, two. We don't get to see the risen star winner Sierra Leone back in the Louisiana Derby. A little disappointed for the local fans in that respect, but when they get a rematch like this amongst the Oaks Phillies, Tarifa and Intricate, Jeff, this is as good as it gets in that part of the country right now, and it might be as good as it gets anywhere leading towards the Kentucky Oaks. These are two very, very legitimate sophomore Phillies. They really are. And I gave Tarifa the edge here, but Intricate was coming off a layoff when they faced each other in the Rachel Alexandria. Again, the wet track kind of throws a monkey wrench into it. You know, Intricate's a gun runner, Philly. Uh, I, um, her win in the Golden Rod was very impressive. She broke her main with Keenan before that. She's mm -hmm. an exceptionally good filly, and I think Tarifa might be as well. You remember her race at Keeneland when she won first right. time out, uh, one by six. Uh, Buffalo form at her next start at a one-turn mile, but since then, won an allowance race, came back and won the Rachel Alexandra, daughter of Bernardini. Uh, there aren't that many Bernardinis left there. There won't be. Uh, good to see that he's still got one really terrific filly in his, uh, 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 you know, among his uh, offspring. And... Um, it's a rematch uh, on fast ground this time. I just went with Tarifa, but um, again, in another situation where you're playing a rolling exotic, there's no way I'm having a ticket that's not using intricate on it somewhere. Interesting thing about these two as they rematch. You say, why would it be any different? You talked about the form cycle, right? It was a layoff situation for Intricate. First start since November. Tarifa had been in her form cycle. I like to look in this situation when horses come back. They're coming off the obviously same layoff because they come out of the same race. What's happened since then? I find it interesting that it was March 3rd when Tarifa returned to the workout tab and has had three works. Mm -hmm. Intricate was back on the workout tab February 29th, four days quicker back to the work tab and has four workouts to the three. So going into the race, Tarifa probably didn't need as much. She was in her form cycle. Intricate probably needed the race and now has had more work since. She might be able to close that gap. I think we're going to see a closer margin. It could run one, two once again, but I don't think she's getting beat by two and three quarter lengths this time. I think Intricate will be better this time and Tarifa may be as well. But I think these two are going to be really matched up evenly in here. Let's give the fans a chance to go back and look at their last matchup, and uh, then we'll put a bow on the fairgrounds Oaks. Uh, as Alpine Princess is on even terms coming toward the quarter pole, Vivi's Dream and Tarifa. Intricate is now running second to last, and Penick has dropped back to last as these three year old fillies turn for home here on a sloppy track at the fairgrounds after three quarters. In one minute, 13.15 seconds, Alpine Princess, Tarifa charging hard on the outside. Perfect shot, and Intricate is also mounting a late bid. Then Vivi's Dream, Penick is the distant. It's Tarifa who's taking the lead here for Flavian Pratt. Intricate is now second. Perfect shot, third. Alpine Princess drop back. Tarifa in the Rachel Alexander Stakes. Tarifa finishes on top by three from Intricate. As you can see, it's going to take some developmental change and swing in the momentum uh, to make up that margin because no doubt the winner was best that day and drawing off a little bit on the end. Uh, Jeff, too deep situation or are you singling in here when we look at a pick five? Well, i I definitely going to use them both somewhere. I prefer Tarifa. Uh, the right. Bernardinis are supposed to get better with age. But the one thing about both these Phillies, if you look at their their pattern, is that they both get faster with every race. Tarifa's mm -hmm. gone from 70 to 86 to 90 on the buyers, and she's not done improving. Intricate has gone from 59 to 72 to 85 to 87. She keeps getting better and better. You expect that the Bernardinis will get better. Gun runner the same. Uh, and then again, on fast ground, it might be a different situation. So, I could see either one of them win, but boy, the way Tarifa was striding out there, maybe it was the off, maybe it was the off track, uh, but she'd done some good work on the fast as well. So it's a really good race by two exceptionally good players. 
our pretty woman's undefeated for Steve Asmussen could be the fly in the ointment to the big favorites. But for me, in an exactathon situation, I think this is one you just box the two favorites and, and try to get through and check off the box and getting one of those six exactas that you need in order to go for the bonus money. It's not a great intra race bet to box those two in an exact, but I think from a contest standpoint, uh, that could be the way to attack and approach that. Time now on the It's Official podcast to look at our two back-to-back Kentucky Derby preps. It's 100-point preps coming up this weekend. We'll start off with the Jeff Ruby Stakes at Turfway Park. The Jeff Ruby, a race that's had many names over the years. And uh, coming up on Saturday, it'll be renewed here, I believe, for the third time as the Jeff Ruby. And uh, the Jeff Ruby Stakes has a field of 14 with a couple also eligibles. Uh, Some news about the horses in this race. Agate Road the 5 will end up scratching here to run in the Louisiana Derby at Fairgrounds. Circle P is expected to run in Maryland in the private term stakes. That should bring Triple Espresso into the field for trainer Todd. Pletcher will have the outside post position in here. So 12 expected to go before we get the final scratches on race day morning. Lucky Jeremy, my favorite name, three-year-old Nola <laughs> horse racing in here, Jeff. Uh, we're certainly rooting for him. He'll be part of what looks to be a pretty good pace. And I hate to use the word cheap speed talking about horses running in a race worth this kind of money, $700,000. But some of the horses that may not have the class on their resume look like the horses who are going to go early. That could set up well for the classy closers. Yeah, this is a really good race. Sometimes, you know, you look at this race and you figure, well, there are no derby horses in here. Um, but, man, I'm telling you, there's some nice prospects here. And they're running, most of them are running either because they are grass horses. And this is the closest thing they're going to get to grass with regards mm-hmm. to a prep race. And then you've got um, the distance. Uh, some of these horses have been begging for a mile and eighth. Um, and then you've got horses like Endlessly, my top selection, who probably – will not have a chance to run on on actual dirt for a while. He's done all of his good work prior to his last race on grass and did very well. Uh, Won two graded stakes on turf in California back in October. You might think, well, maybe he was just an early developer, wasn't embarrassed in the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Turf, and then came out and won the El Camino Real Derby, which not only was a good race but qualifies him for the Preakness. But this is a logical spot. I've been very Mm -hmm. impressed with the way Michael McCarthy has managed his horses. He doesn't do anything crazy. He just right. takes what is given to him. And uh, rather than getting uh, high on endlessly, let's just keep him on the all weather, come back and, and and do what we did in the, at Golden Gate. And that was a very strong race. I'm telling you, endlessly won the race. He was three to five. But Tapolo and guy named Joe, they're not empty stalls. Those cold, those yeah. can run. And I love the way endlessly won that race from off the pace. And I think he's got a chance to come right back and do it again uh, in Kentucky. Let's go to Bill Down's call at Golden Gate Fields for the El Camino Real. Has a lead by about three lengths. Endlessly, the chalk comes on the outside, and endlessly has a sixteenth of a mile to make up two lengths. And it's Tapala with the lead close to home, but it's endlessly, endlessly, the favor sweeps on by for the win. Tapalo second, guy named Joe third, old triangle fourth. Endlessly the favorite in the Jeff Ruby. I think a horse has got a chance at a price in here is Northern Flame. Third in the Rebel Stakes behind the much uh, respected Timberlake, the Brad Cox trainee. It was a grade one winner at two and has come back uh, to run well in his one start so far at three. He's by Flame Away. He's got a little synthetic pedigree there. The Flame Aways have done okay at Turfway. Uh, and, and the form seems to be improving for this one. A trainer, Kenny McPeak's three-year-olds all seem to hit the board. They have been playing in all of these races, no matter or the locale. I think he's bringing this one to Turfway with the shot. I'm surprised to see Julian Leperu for as dominant as he was at Keeneland in the poly track era and riding the synthetics in Kentucky has never won this race, the signature race at Turfway Park. I think he's got a real shot in here. Northern Flame under Leperu, I think, is one to keep uh, consideration here. And if he runs well, that will certainly bode well for the people who have, you know, good tidings to Timberlake as he pre- uh, preps towards the Arkansas Derby. So if you're following the trail from the big picture in here, and you're a Timberlake fan, you certainly want to see Northern Flame, Woodcourt, horses coming out of the Rebel run well. But with the surface change, it's not apples to apples. So if you're a fan of Timberlake and these horses don't take to the 
synthetic. It's not necessarily an indictment on him, but if they do run well here, uh, it looks good for Timberlake. I'm going to give Northern Flame a shot in here, Jeff. Otello coming from Florida, Curlin, who, you know, we don't know if this one's going to handle the synthetic, but it's got the right running style coming from a bit off the pace. Clement Castellano teaming up here. I think Otello's got a shot in this particular spot. And then, of course, the favorite endlessly. I think it comes down to those three if I'm playing that uh, Bayou Bluegrass pick five. I want to use those three runners in here and see if I can get by with those with that trio. You bring up a good point because uh, a lot of people look at these races and want to um, use them as kind of uh, evaluator, uh, a, a, a evaluation type of races where, okay, he comes out of, like, for example, you mentioned Otella coming out of the Holy Bull. We want to learn as much as we can about the Holy Bull, um, and then we want to see how Otella runs. I mean, mm -hmm. if he runs badly, it's not necessarily a knock. But if he runs well, it's certainly a positive. And you get horses yeah. coming out of the races. That's one of, one of the reasons why one of the tools I'm using with Endlessly. Because if you run at Golden Gate on an all-other racetrack up there, mm -hmm. you don't really know who you're running with. But I'm telling you my experience and my evaluation of the runner-up and the third-place finisher right. in that race, that was a much stronger race than you're normally going to get um, mm -hmm. from, a, a, from, from a race like that which in the past has produced a Preakness winner. So I think yeah. Endless – the other thing I want to point out about the Endlessly's race, uh, a point that I forgot to make is when you have an all-weather track like that, they, the horses, because there's no kickback, they tend to finish closer together, more of a, yeah. more of a, on a bunch. In that race at Golden Gate, they were spread out from there mm -hmm. to the Golden Gate Bridge itself, which means right. they ran. Those first two, three horses mm -hmm. really ran in that race. Mm -hmm. And it looked like an end of a dirt race. So I, I think Endless Leap to me is, is a gamble at 5-2. to two. And I'm not saying he's necessarily a single. I think the horses you mentioned, Jeremy, are horses you certainly should have on your ticket somewhere. Um, but for me, the gamble is going to be Endless Leap. Jeff Ruby has produced the Kentucky Derby winner and the runner-up the past two years. Last year, it was two fills running second out of this race in the Kentucky Derby. Two years ago, it was Rich Strike. We're still trying to figure out how he did it, uh, but uh, he did it two years ago, also coming in from the Turfway path. So yeah. a race that you certainly want to consider. And from a gambling standpoint, too, throw the field back up here one quick second. Don't sleep on uh, the outside runner in here, uh, that being Triple Espresso. 20 to 1 in the morning line, because also eligibles tend to be a better price than they ought to be. People don't do the, the due diligence of keeping up with the scratches and changes a lot of times, and you'll get an overlay price. Todd Pletcher's won this race several times. Uh, do not be surprised if Triple Espresso is not a factor in here, even from an outside draw. My own and eighth, the Turfway will have a decent run into the clubhouse turn there uh, to try to find some uh, position. But Triple Espresso may be a fourth horse to consider in there, but I'm definitely using three when we talk about the uh, pick five. We teased you with the field for the uh, Louisiana Derby. Let's go to that next, and this will be the final leg of that Bayou Bluegrass pick five. Louisiana Derby goes as race number 12 on Saturday from the fairgrounds, mile and 316. One horse who's been very familiar with the fairground series this year is Track Phantom. He's running all four legs now if he goes on Saturday. He won the Gun Runner. He won the LeCompte. He ran a good second in the Risen Star. We'll see if Steve Asmussen has this one still rocking and rolling at his best. He's going to have to overcome an outside post in here, Jeff, of post 12. But he's got a good running style. He's a horse who can make the front, doesn't have to make the front but he gets that first over trip if not on the lead and that's very effective he takes a lot of the variables out of the question and they'll have a long run into the turn here uh, at a mile and three sixteenths. and i'm not finding a lot of speed in this race jeremy i mean no. uh track phantom i actually like that outside draw for him first of all this is a mile and three sixteenths. he'll have forever to get over and mm -hmm. and and long enough to choose his tactics choose his spot being outside joel can kind of look over to his left, see if anybody's going. If nobody's going, then um, he can go. Uh, if uh, if someone is committed to going, and I don't see who that might be. If you can point out another speed here, I'm all here. I think Antiquary is going to try to go towards the inside because Todd's got multiples in here. He's got an inside draw. And they went to the front last year with Kings Barnes with a horse who kind of looked very similar to this on paper. You didn't think he was that fast, but they had intent and just went and wired the field. So I think Anna Quirin would be the only other horse in this race that's going to have any intent on the lead. So Track Phantom's either on the lead or sitting first over. It's going to be a good trip for him. It is. And, and Anna Quirin, I mean, I watched him train before he ever ran, and I thought he could run, and Conquest Warrior beat him. He had a good gamble at Anna Quirin I had that day at 4-1, to one, mm -hmm. and I didn't know who Conquest Warrior was. I soon found out 
Uh, mm-hmm. So that was actually a good race. Comes back and wins again. I, I, I think he was five to two the second race. I'm not sure why he didn't get bet more than that. Um, but he really, I mean, you're right about the tactics. If I, if I'm Todd, I'm saying to Johnny V, let's maybe let him run out of there and get some good mm-hmm. position. But he's not really that quick. I mean, the first right. race, one, one turn mile, 46 and four to the half is not fast. And then, yeah. of course, in his next start, they went 49. So if that's who Track Phantom has to worry about with regards to pace pressure, I like Track Phantom a lot. Right. And I thought Track, Track Phantom ran really well in the Risen Star. Now, you might say, okay, well, he made the lead, so he's supposed to run well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he did. Um, but, again, uh, I thought he he kind of got a little surprised by Sierra Leone in the final furlong. And I yeah. thought he held on really, really well. Um, the only consideration I have for this is that he, you know, he's been tested quite a few times. But, man, I'm telling you, I think he's a, a better horse than I have given him credit for. And under these circumstances, if he's got some uh, another good one left in him, which I don't see why he wouldn't, I think Tran mm-hmm. Fana controls this race on the lead or from a stocking position. I think he's going to win it. I think he's going to beat this field. And I, I, I like him. He's, he's, what is he, three to one in the morning line? Let's see. Yeah. Yeah. I can live with that. And, and I think that's about what he'll be. I think yeah. that's, that's a pretty fair estimation in here. I don't think you're going to see a heavy seven to five, eight no, kind of I don't think so. uh, I don't... in this kind of race. Yeah. And if, if you're worried about him being worn down, being the fourth race of the series, I know every horse is an individual, but Steve Asmussen kind of went down this road with Epicenter. He did it with Midnight Bourbon. And those horses ran strong through the Triple Crown even after really waxing it throughout the course of this fairground series. And they ran well in those races and continued to run well through the Triple Crown. So uh, I wouldn't be surprised. Uh, Steve knows his horses and which ones can take the rigor and which ones can't. This horse has obviously thrived on it, and uh, uh, we'll see how it works out on Saturday. A couple other horses in here, Catching Freedom, the five, was the third place finisher in the Risen Star, I think certainly a contender. And the 11, Tuscan Gold, this is a horse I was really high on off his debut fourth. He ran against his stablemate, Sierra Leone, in a race where he just had worlds of trouble in the debut last year at Aqueduct. His comeback race at Gulfstream was very good, going two turns, drawing off, uh, beating the the uh, son of Arrogate, or the brother to Arrogate, who's the runner-up in there, who was favored for Todd Pletcher, and he beat him easily by six lengths. I think he's got some quality about him in Tuscan Gold. He's got a tough outside post position as well. But if this race runs back through the Risen Star, uh, the top two contenders in here, obviously, again, are Asmussen and Cox with the horses who ran 2-3 in that one. Let's go back to John Dooley's call of, of the uh, Risen Star Stakes. Brilliance toward the outside is Cardinal Awesome Ruda. Chasing Freedom is four wide. B Dancer, Real Men, Violin toward the inside as they turn for home after three quarters in one minute 14.74 seconds. Track Phantom charging on the outside is Resilience. Hall of Fame flattens out. Chasing Freedom trying to keep a straight path and Sierra Leone charging hard on the outside. It's Track Phantom. Resilience chasing freedom in tight quarters between horses. Sierra Leone on the outside for Tyler Gaffleone. Sierra Leone. Sierra Leone Track track Phantom down. Big race there from the winner. Big race from the runner-up and several in that race. It looks like one of the best preps we've seen this season on the Triple Crown Trail. We'll see how it shakes out, what it might mean for Sierra Leone when we see him in a couple weeks at Keeneland in the Bluegrass Stakes as we're trying to evaluate these three-year-olds. Okay, that's a look at the five races for that uh, Bayou Bluegrass Stakes Five. We've still got three races to handicap here on the podcast. We're going to go to Laurel Park, Oaklawn, and Santa Anita to wrap things up. At Laurel Park, it's the private term stakes, $100,000, mile on the 16th. This will be the first two-turn race in Maryland this year for horses locally based who might be headed towards the Preakness. They'll still have the uh, Federico Tessio stakes coming up in about four weeks' time, and then on potentially to Pimlico. We saw Coffee with Chris come out of this race uh, last year, end up in the Preakness field, so certainly can happen. Again, they've been running one-turn miles with that extended run to the long finish line, the second finish line at Laurel to this point. Now they use the proper finish line, uh, 16th of a mile shorter, and uh, a mile and a 16th with a short run into the first turn. So you want to have a little more speed in this particular kind of configuration, I think. And Jeff, uh, as we look down at the field for the private term stakes, you've got uh, four of them, five of them, triple crown nominees in this particular spot. Copper Tax, Speed Runner, and Vagel starts with a dream and Circle P. Uh, you've got a horse, though, coming off a maiden win last time that you want to alert the fans about. Yeah, uh, his name is, now should I call him Celtic Contender? Or That's what Dave Rodman says, and I never yeah. question Dave Rodman. I, I suppose that's probably correct, but <laughs> I remember the Lakers playing the Celtics, so <laughs> I'm not sure if this isn't Celtic contender. 
Uh, either way, he's number six on the program. And uh, after finishing a, a promising third sprinting and, and a slop first time up, kind of gave him a little bit of a run in that race, stretched out to a one-turn mile. And one thing about this race is there, there, that I looked about him. I wanted to see some progress. Some, uh, for, you know, I wanted to see him step forward. I always say the second race is a lot more important than the first one with maidens where we're three-year-olds because they, yeah. they can do anything in the first start. They don't know what they're doing, you know. Right. They're supposed to improve. Well, I was looking for that with Celtic con uh, Contender, and he really did. Not only did he show excellent speed uh, to be on the pace and did it under a nice hold that he could have gone faster, but when they asked him to, uh, to quicken from the top of the stretch to that long run into the wire – he did it the right way. He's a good mm -hmm. mover, good-looking chestnut colt, grandson of Curlin. And uh, he now stretches out to two turns, which I think will be in his range. I also think that he'll be on or near the lead. He showed speed around one turn. He should do a two-turning yep. well. Um, and he's 6-1 to one in the morning line. And he's going from maiden to stake. But man, on numbers, he's already right there with, these, with the potential of being faster as he gets more experience. I like Celtic Contender here as a gamble, and I certainly liked his first uh, his win uh, that took place here at Laurel uh, not too long ago. Put your eyes on this one. It was a good-looking one at Laurel. Here's Dave Rodman, the aforementioned. Celtic Contender takes over. Celtic Contender turns for home with a quarter of a mile left to go to the second wire. Come rain or shine out after that one. And Brady Bears off the inside now. Still driven. The inside is Davy Jones in fourth for a long and a half left to go. And it's Celtic Contender and Jebby on Toledo. They're ridden out and rolling home by six. Celtic Contender pouring it on. Now seven in front. Scramble for second. Here's Davy Jones up the rail. Then Brady Bear followed by Come Rain or Shine. Celtic Contender a sharp look win. Celtic contender from Davy Jones and Brady Bear come rain or shine. I like how the probability win meter there with the races in Maryland went from 70% to 98% in about three jumps. <laughs> he really did kick it in clear at the top of the stretch and he's going to be a factor in this spot. Inveigled the horse coming out of the macho, uh, Mucho Macho Man and the Holy Bulls. Got a little class edge in here. It also has a little pace about it for Jane Sabelli. I would assume Inveigled's going to be uh, one of the horses who's a major contender in this particular spot. And then Speediness, the local who won the Miracle Wood Stakes. He's front running speed in here. He hasn't gone too turns yet a couple one turn trio of one turn miles on his resume certainly wasn't losing any ground uh, or momentum in some of his wins uh i'm not so sure with the pedigree where he stands because he's by great notion he usually gets more shorter horses but he's got to include on the damn side is to, and that's all stamina so maybe speediness handles the stretch out for trainer jamie nesson here he's certainly in raging good form he is. I mean, this is a good contentious race. You mentioned uh, in Vegas. Again, we want to go to school here a little bit because he comes out of that uh, Holy Bull race. He was fourth, beaten six flanks. And I mean, OK, so he wasn't quite up to that group, but that's a good group, or at least it's supposed yeah. to be, you know, Hades and domestic product and a horse named Fierceness. So, you yeah. know, I mean, he's supposed to drop down to this level, a, a stakes that's um, not a graded stakes, it's the listed stakes. Right. And be able to take that form and apply it nicely here. And I suspect he's going to run well. But there are others in here that have a chance, really, to say, hey, wait a minute. No, we're, we're, not, uh, we're not too bad ourselves. Right. Very, very uh, interesting race here. Maybe not for derby horses, but for horses that could run in secondary races for good three-year-olds. Like Peter Pan type races, you mm -hmm. know, where they're not quite the classics, but they're still very good races. And, uh, I'm interested to see, uh, for one, if Celtic contender is up to this level in just his third career start. He is the, the race name, the private terms, named for the 1988 Wood Memorial winner for Charlie Hadry. Came out of Maryland, went up to New York, went on to Kentucky, I believe was favored at post time over winning colors in the Derby that year. Mm -hmm. uh, private terms. Uh, I remember watching him from the bowling alley when I was a kid. Wide world of sports and the preps. I watched his Wood Memorial from the bowling alley. Uh, one of those, where were you when moments? I don't know why I remember seeing private terms, but uh, uh, he was a good one back in the day for a Maryland based uh, trainer, Charlie Hadry. Let's go to Oaklawn next as uh, our continuing handicapping around the country moves to uh, the Midwest of the country, the Essex $600,000 grade three race here. This is a prep towards the Oaklawn handicap coming up in about a month's time, mile and an eighth, same distance that we'll see in the Oaklawn handicap. And these are a lot of the same horses that we saw uh in the Razorback, some of them coming back in this particular spot. Uh, uh, Magic Tap, the runner-up.
up in that one. Octane's not back out of the Razorback Stakes. And then first mission drops in class out of the Pegasus World Cup. Jeff, he didn't fire at all in that spot. I thought mm -hmm. first mission was going to run a good race in there uh, coming out of the Clark, his first start of the year, and he just did not get involved at all. Uh, what can we make of first mission trying to bounce back? I don't know. I, 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 mean, I didn't like him in that race as much as you did, but I didn't. I thought he'd be at least competitive, you know. I, I thought he could hit the board, uh, and he didn't do that. I wish you would have told me that with more enthusiasm. Uh, before. Well, I, mean, I, I thought I thought he was really that I was right either, you know. I, I didn't know what to make of him, but I he could have saved me. Yeah, well, I mean, he just, I mean uh, he, uh, wasn't right in myself. Now he's got a, I assume he's okay. Brad brings him back. Um, he'd run well in the Clark, and um, I just I don't know those. The, the form of that race is pretty good. I, I you know, let's face it. So um, yeah. this is a considerably softer spot for sure. Again, I don't have any issue with the outside post going a mile length at Oakland. He's not a horse that necessarily has to go to the front. In fact, he probably prefers to sit exactly where he's going to be in this race, outside, mm -hmm. right behind the leaders. Move when you want to move, not when someone makes you move. And I think right. Mission's got a real good chance to bounce back. Triple-digit buyer number two races back. Uh, and that race, if repeated uh, in the Clark, probably would be good enough to win. I'm going for a bit of a here. Again, horses that I would use in a rolling exotic situation, playing pick threes, pick fours, whatever. First Mission would certainly be on the ticket because I know on his best day he's good enough to win. But uh, a price horse for me is Wizard of Westwood, not because it's, you know, uh, you know, March Madness. I have nothing against those kinds of uh, plays where you're, you know, <laughs> you're using a horse because of whatever the horse's name is. It has nothing to do with the horse. He doesn't know what his name is. But I don't necessarily dismiss it either, you know, mm -hmm. a factor. But the one thing that, that caught my eye in Wizard of Westwood, even though he's never quite beaten these kinds of horses, is that he might be better on dirt than he is on grass. And he's been mostly a grass or a synthetic horse. Mm -hmm. The first time he ever ran was out here in California and um, he, he had a dead heat win. I thought that was pretty good. And then in an off the turf race at Churchill, two races back, he just crushed. And again, it's one of these situations where maybe they didn't, maybe Michael wasn't sure or didn't think or didn't know whether he was that good on dirt, but he said, well, whatever. I mean, I'll leave him in, you know, what's, you know, and the horse just ran off. And maybe he's thinking, you know something? He's dirt horse. You know, let's keep him on dirt from right now. I love where he's drawn. I love his style. Um, he's run well on the lead, doesn't need the lead to win, can, can stalk, pounce, and go. And I think he's going to get a great trip, and I think he's going to be a decent price. And while he did not run well at Turfway in his last start uh, as the favorite, I'm just going to think that maybe back on dirt uh, he's going to rebound. Has a bullet work uh, on the training center mm -hmm. trickle down since then. I know he's doing well. Uh, he's got a little bit of time off now. Lightly race, room for improvement. Um, so I'm going to try him as a gamble uh, at eight to one, number three, Wizard of Westwood, in a race in which I'm convinced that if First Mission decides to show up and run, he'll probably win. Ferran Giroux in town to ride for Brad Cox on first mission. Interesting. He's also riding Nash for him in the hot spring sticks. Uh, talented, but disappointed three-year-old his past couple starts see if he can't get back on the beam uh on the undercard here on saturday at oakland but for Giroud not to be riding louisiana derby day at fairgrounds pretty significant uh i know this is a six hundred thousand dollar race the other one's a two hundred thousand dollar race but there's a lot of money on the line including a million dollar race uh fairgrounds and, and, and a big undercard in support so I think they think this horse is doing well right now that, uh, you know, because Sias was the regular rider for first mission. So this isn't a Florent Giroux mount all the time. He's coming to ride this horse off the bullet workout. So maybe they've got him good again, you know, because like you said, the good version of first mission is pretty darn good. Uh, let's see. It's going to be an interesting edition of the Essex. Let's go to Santa Anita for race number seven on Saturday. The feature race on the uh, weekend at the Great Race Place will be the San Luis Ray and the San Luis Ray on the turf here. Uh, we go to our final handicapping destination of the weekend, a mile and a half on the grass, turf marathoners. Jeff, who do you like in your backyard? I pick Planetario, but this, uh, we saw this in the San Marcos, it's the same horse, the same run. There isn't an edge here. Um, this used to be a really high-quality race. Um, 
but the grass horses uh, that we have have kind of dissipated. Um, uh, I just think, you know, he, he got beat last time out, but he's won over the course here. In a race that I, I'll watch, it's a local race, um, but I don't know if there's really much of a gamble here. Uh, again, it looks like a repeat of the last race we saw uh, with this group, and um, so we'll watch him again. Mr. Cut got the win that day in the San Marcos. Planetario was rallying for second. Let's go and take a look back at that with Frank Miramati. Short man and Planetario, a quarter of a mile to go. It's Balladeer. Irish Prophet comes to him. Missed the cut, traveling beautifully along the rail. Needs racing room. He's trying to get through the narrowest of openings, and he gets through. Missed the cut, scrapes that rail. And on the outside, Planetario, but it's missed the cut. And Joel Rosario spurting clear at the 16th pole. Planetario's trying to get to him late. Missed the cut. Missed the cut. Rosario put on a clinic, wins by a length and a half. Planetario is second. It's a long way back for them across the course, battling it out for third. That's a look at the San Luis Ray feature race Saturday at Santa Anita. So our eight races are in the books for handicapping. I want to remind you, we've got a Coast to Coast Pick 5 where you get 10 times wager rewards points when you bet the Coast to Coast Pick 5 Saturday or Sunday or both uh, when you bet with First Bet and Express Bet. That $25,000 Exactathon challenges you to handicap and hit six races where you click on the Exacta. You got to hit the Exacta in six of the 12 races on Saturday at Fairgrounds. Make your share of twenty thousand dollars in doing so and we also want to direct you to our website uh, first bet and express bet to check out the blog of john white our senior handicapper there uh, john's got his triple crown picks this weekend for the jeff ruby and the louisiana derby an update on his kentucky derby top 10 list as well so a lot cooking a lot of good stuff this weekend and that new wager the bayou bluegrass pick five again 15 percent takeout on that one dollar minimum uh for the bayou bluegrass pick five you can bet that through first bet and express bet as well jeff this is gonna be a fun week and not only the three-year-old races we're talking about, but the handicap division with the New Orleans handicap. Uh, you got a big undercard. Kentucky Oaks with a couple big preps, the Bourbonette, and also the Fairgrounds Oaks. Uh, a lot of divisions in play this weekend. It should be a good one. It really should. In fact, in looking at this list of races that we're handicapping, other than maybe the uh, San Luis Ray, uh, Mr. Cut, Planetario going at each other again, uh, whatever, what I mean, Mr. Cut got through, Planetario came from the outside. I mean, I don't know how they're yeah. going to fit up again. But other than that race, every race that we did today, the first seven are good handicapping exercises with chances, yeah. decent prices, and chances to look at the videos and try to envision who you think is going to improve enough to step up. With me, it's winnable and endlessly and um, Celtic contender. Those kind of horses um, are horses that I'm looking forward to wagering on because mm -hmm. I don't think they're going to be eight, you know, six to five or anything like that. Right. So uh, I mean, it's, it, and they're important races too. They're stepping mm -hmm. stones to bigger and better things. So we've got a really good um, series of races here to watch and wager on. And, you know, sometimes it gets a little dry. Sometimes it's, there's not a whole lot to work with, but this week is, is full of some good gambling opportunities. I'm looking forward to it and I'll have, that TV on the races, that TV on the basketball. <laughs> I'm going to be just nice and comfortable here in my den uh, watching all, all the good action. You mentioned dry. It won't be dry in New York. They've already canceled racing because of a deluge of rain expected at Aqueduct on Saturday. So no racing in New York. That's going to be good news for the business barometers, certainly in Kentucky and Louisiana and other venues around the track where some of that New York money is going to go on Saturday. But the big days at Fairgrounds and at Turfway certainly should be big benefactors of no racing in New York on Saturday. So we will We'll be back on Tuesday to wrap up a huge weekend of racing on our It's Official podcast. Jeff and I will take a look at five hot topics in racing in that one. But between now and then, enjoy the hoops, enjoy the racing. Have a great weekend, everybody, and we will talk to you on Tuesday.